Plum. You're a world record holder at the age of 13. Ilsa Conrad, the girl with the far left heart. Tonight on our century, the Aussie champions who took on the world and won. Our Dawn, our Dawn, and that Malvern star, Oppie. I'm more proud to think that I have brought a world record to Australia. A hundred years of record breakers. The men and women who gave Australia a proud sporting tradition. The great English all-rounder Ian Botham once said, you could go to any Aussie beach and pick a scratch side that would give you a run for your money. Australians hate to lose. Our competitive spirit was born on the sports field and it's spread to just about every other aspect of our life. Now this bat, as tiny as it is, belonged to the great Don Bradman, who started his cricket career right here on this ground in Barrel. And this was the bat that he used in the 1934 Ashes Tour, in which he hit triple and double test centuries and broke even more records. But records, of course, were made to be broken. And Aussies like the Don were made to break them. You're looking at Australia's greatest sportsman. He was also one of our earliest movie stars. Reginald Snowy Baker, the only person to represent Australia at four sports, rugby, diving, swimming and boxing. He reached championship level in 22 others, everything from polo to fencing. In the years before television, we put our sporting heroes up on the big screen. And here he is as the boxing parson in an Australian movie called The Man from Kangaroo. But no gold medals for his acting. In the 1908 Olympics, Snowy should have won gold in boxing, but his opponent in the final was the son of the referee. The record shows that the ref cast the deciding vote in that fight, and needless to say, Snowy came second. But in movies like this, he was always the winner. Long before Crocodile Dundee, Snowy Baker went to Hollywood, where film directors used and abused his talents, and nearly killed him in the process. No cliff was too high, no horse was too wild. And no villain, well, no villain was too villainous. Snowy took to Hollywood like he took to water. Of course, he always saved the girl, even when she was having a lend of him. Behind the scenes, his deeds were just as legendary. Snowy taught Rudolph Valentino to ride a horse, and he showed Douglas Fairbanks how to crack a whip. In the 1940s, he was polo coach to Shirley Temple and Elizabeth Taylor. You name it, he did it. But if Snowy Baker was the original Aussie all-rounder, then Walter Lindrum played just one game, and that was billiards, and he was better than anybody else. Goodbye. Walter Albert Lindrum had no choice. His father, grandfather, great-grandfather, brother, sister and nephew all won Australian billiards competitions. There was never any doubt about young Walter joining the family business. A childhood accident in his home of Kalgoorlie cost Lindrum half his right index finger. No worries, he just played left-handed. Over three decades, Walter broke 57 world records, racking up thousands of points with monotonous regularity. I've been asked by the Fox Movie Tone to play one or two shots for you at billiards. I should like to go on playing all day for you, but you will appreciate that space will only permit me playing four or five shots. Thank you. 
People didn't want to see him play all day. They wanted trick shots, not records. And finally, the quick fire shot. Here, Lindrum is playing a nursery cannon. Effective, but about as exciting as watching paint dry. So they changed the rules, but they couldn't change the results. <laughs> Like a big schoolboy, he gallops up the path to his father and mother, and you've got to give them some credit for sending Don in. This man could have been a champion in just about any sport. Super fast reflexes, a sharp eye, and an ice cool temperament. Hammond to Bradman, a single, and Don reaches the hundred, equaling Hobbs' record of 12 test centuries in the England-Australia series. Almost 80,000 people hail the champion. It's 50 years since Don Bradman stopped making and breaking records. But schoolboys still know his score. He played 52 test matches, ended up with a total of 6,996 runs. Cricket was our religion in the 1930s. The Don brought men and women through the turnstiles. It was an escape from the Depression. Here are the scores of a record maker who has written our name in electric letters on every scoring board in the world. You know, I feel today, amidst all these lights and cameras and so on, somewhat like a movie star. Uh, of course, at a very different salary. Bradman's earnings were modest compared to today's millionaire cricketers. In the early days, it was 25 quid for a test match. Yet the Don was bigger than any movie star. He was like royalty. In the grounds of Balmoral Castle, the greatest cricketer of our time, Donald George Bradman, 40-year-old skipper of Australia's test team, bids farewell to the King and Queen, to Britain, and to first-class cricket. An informal stroll with King George in 1948 made headlines in England, when the Don was photographed with his hands in his pockets. And I was accused then of being rude to the King, putting my hands in my pockets, and I replied and said, well, I wasn't rude to him because uh, I wasn't the only one. And in any case, he had a kilt on. He couldn't put his hand in his pocket. <laughs> it was a storm in a tea break. Bradman's Invincibles were undefeated on that tour. It was just the boost that Australia needed after six years of world war. But even he wasn't perfect. Olive bowling and Don playing perhaps his last test innings here. He needed only four runs to average 100 for his career. It was the most glorious duck of all time. Well, it isn't often you get a big hand when you make a duck, but this was different. Bradman retired at 40. It was the years, not the Yorkers, that were catching up with him. And I think I'm probably the best judge of the many little creeks and groans that go on in my joints throughout the day. Goodbye and good luck, Bradman. May the duck Never lay eggs on your doorstep. Free picnic in the early 1900s. And the office boy could take on the boss and beat him. We were wartime allies, but that didn't stop us squeezing the stuffing out of each other. It's 1918, and the armed forces of Australia, America, England and Canada stage their own mini olympics in london our first national heroes weren't prime ministers or poets it was our players who first gave us a sense of national pride in this race she breaks four world records the 200 meters 220 yards 400 meters and 440 yards it was in the pool that we left the world in our wake just look at that style the most powerful ever in women's swimming and it makes her the only girl in the world to break the five minute barrier for the 440 she broke 18 world records in training for the 1956 Olympics in Melbourne. And her name wasn't Dawn Fraser. In the women's 400 metres race, Lorraine Kratt, who had already rewritten the record book for all distances, proved in a class of her own. Displaying her perfect, effortless style, led from the start, finishing almost eight seconds ahead of her teammate Dawn Fraser. If Lorraine Kratt had been born at any other time, she would have been a swimming legend. Melbourne in 1956 was meant to be Lorraine's crowning glory. But along came an 18-year-old with attitude. The women's 220 is a match race between Lorraine Crapp in lane five and Dawn Fraser in lane four. 
around about 14 years of age that I made a decision in my life that I wanted to be a champion swimmer and uh, I had an altercation with a couple of amateur officials because it was found out that I'd taken two shillings in a, a swim race at a picnic that we had and that made me a professional. So I had to stand out for two years. It made me terribly determined to be the best swimmer in the world. Don Fraser first, Lorraine Crabb a length and a half away second, two minutes, 21.2 seconds, yet another world record. Lorraine beaten but by no means disgraced, offers congratulations to Australia's new girl swimming sensation, Dawn Fraser. Dawn Fraser won gold medals at the Melbourne and Rome Olympics. In Tokyo in 1964, she went for the hat trick. Dawn Fraser, all set to make history. Never before has a girl swimmer won three successive Olympic titles for the 100 metres freestyle. And Dawn Fraser wins with a new Olympic record of 59.9 seconds. So it's golden glory for Dawn Fraser. A gold medal winner and a champion, Lorraine Crapp got on with life. This will be my last competitive season. I won't be swimming after this year. We'll be getting married after the Games and coming back to Australia. The fact is that Lorraine had already married. She'd married in secret to the Olympic team doctor. They kept it quiet to avoid controversy. Some years after her Olympic retirement, a traffic accident left Lorraine without feeling in her ankles. Tragically, she could no longer swim. Only two countries have competed in every Olympics since the modern games began in 1896, Greece and Australia. 87 gold, 85 silver, and 119 bronze medals later, we've come to expect a lot from our sporting champions. Yes, he's he got can. it! Tremendous effort! And she will stamp her personality on that race. Elliot moves into the lead. He's running so easily, it's hard to believe the most miraculous mile ever is coming up. 10 metres now, Brooks in front. It could be our straightest goal. Five metres, four, three, two, one, go! Go to Australia! Go! Half of our gold medals have been won either in the water or on the water. At the Los Angeles Olympic Games, a husky, blonde-haired Australian easily won the single Skulls gold medal, a feat he'd already performed at Amsterdam in 1928 and at the first Empire Games at Hamilton, Canada. During the quarterfinals of the 1928 Olympics, Bobby Pierce was winning when a family of ducks crossed his path. Bobby pulled up, let them pass, lost his lead, regained it, and then won the race. Here you see Bobby coasting to a 300-yard win, which earned him 1,000 much-needed English pounds and the title. I just want to take this opportunity to thank them all. And I'm nearly forgetting my pal Ted Fox. Uh, both of us were, were together in 1928. We were pals, and it was kind of hard to, to be out in front of Ted. After the finish line, I can assure you, we both cried on one another's shoulder. I'm very, very happy. Oh, no, that's all I can say. Let's go. Bobby was crying all the way to the bank. He was unbeaten for 12 years and he earned a fortune. But sport is often stranger than fiction. The Lithgow Flash, Marjorie Jackson, broke the 200 metres world record at the Helsinki Olympics in 1952. The record had stood for 17 years. It was set by this woman, Stella Walsh from Poland. In 1980, Stella was shot dead during a bank robbery. At the morgue, they discovered that she was in fact a he. Marjorie Jackson had beaten a record set by a man. ...of an Adelaide store to watch five girls attack the world marathon typing record. For a moment in 1962, typing became a spectator sport. She's been hitting those keys for 53 hours. As long as someone keeps score or has a stopwatch, you can go for a record on the dance floor or down the road. You've got to be in it to win it. Since the start of our century, fun runs and bike races have been staged. Out of the pack, every so often comes a true champion. The language is roughly French, but the accent is unmistakably Australian. 
Sir Hubert Opperman was as popular in Europe as he was at home. And he was a man who enjoyed his work. You glide over the road with the greatest of ease. Hubert Opperman, wonder man of cycling, limbers up for the greatest mass attack on record that athletics has ever known. Cycling was a glamour sport in the 1930s and 40s. And Oppie was like an Errol Flint on wheels as he broke record after record. A team of timekeepers check the laps and go nearly dizzy as the flying pedals of Opperman eclipse more than 20 records and set more than 30 new ones. 24 hours, over 50 records. 60 years later, some of those records still stand. In the 1930s, Europe was considered the centre of the cycling universe. But Oppie invited their best to come here to Tasmania, and he beat them all. Perhaps above everything else, I am more proud to think that I have brought a world record to Australia. For these days, after my travels abroad, I am more Australian than ever. How do you make these records, Oppie? I drink plenty of milk. I eat uh, shredded raw carrots with tomatoes and lettuce. I have raw egg yolks with orange juice to make them just a little bit more palatable. Why, we've only got to follow that schedule and we'll be making records too. Why, certainly, provided you have a wife like Mrs. Oppie. Part diplomat, part super salesman, Sir Hubert Opperman went on to become a minister in the Menzies government. Some champions chose a different ministry. The healing hands belong to Australia's greatest tennis player. Margaret Court won 24 major championships and no other tennis player, male or female, can match her record. Her two Grand Slams and three Wimbledons were just a warm-up for her new life with the Pentecostal Church in Western Australia. Thank you, Jesus, the pain has gone from my back. to lean on, Aussies will argue about who was the best and why. This publican owned the fastest fists in boxing. In 1952, Jimmy Carruthers threw 147 punches in 139 seconds to become Australia's first official world champion. And Carruthers is going to win this by a mile, ladies and gentlemen, in Australia. So I'm glad to be the first Australian to take a, a title for Australia, a world title. Then there was the puff of smoke that set Australia on fire. And what about Farley, winning the Melbourne Cup in 1930, carrying nine stone, 12 pounds? Or Peter Thompson, the gentleman golfer, who won the British Open five times? Uh, I'm very happy, as you can see. And uh, I know my wife is very happy also, wherever she is. I don't know where she is. <laughs> The great John Landy was the first Australian to break the four-minute mile. There were no records broken in this race, but Landy did something which has become a permanent reminder of what sportsmanship is all about. They passed the halfway mark in two minutes, two seconds, and then there's a sensation. Exclusive picture of Clark's fall, made available by courtesy of the Melbourne Sun. Landy ran on a few strides and then came back to help his fallen opponent. A truly magnificent gesture of sportsmanship. Recovering, Landy runs off the track slightly, but he's soon back, chasing the leaders to whom he's given a good 35-yard start. John Landy was the nice guy who finished first. The crowd is wild with excitement. Never has there been such a race. He's a great champion, all right. Champion runner and true sportsman. He sacrificed all chance of a new record. He's missed disqualification by stepping off the track, but he's still first to the tape. And still the champion. Now, it goes without saying that great sportsmen aren't always great sports. But at least for that one moment, John Landy proved that winning isn't everything. Tonight, you've seen a select handful of great Australians. There are, of course, hundreds of others. You could say that breaking records is in our blood. Take this place, for instance. More records have been broken here at North Sydney Pool than any other swimming pool anywhere in the world. But whatever the sport, from footballers to fences, they all had ability. They all refused to give in, and then they found that little bit extra. That's what Louise Savage does every day. 
Louise was born with a spine condition called myelodysplasia. Crutches were more of a hindrance than a help. So, she hopped into a wheelchair. Suvard dominated the pace from the start, and as the pack headed for home, the Aussie's broad shoulders carried her to victory. If she continues at the rate she's been going, Louise could become our most successful athlete ever. World records in the 200 metres, 800 metres, 1500 metres and 5000 metres. So far, seven Paralympic gold medals and one silver. In 1998, Louise competed in the Boston Marathon. She was behind for the entire race and then she did this. I guess if any athlete sums up the unstoppable Aussie spirit, then she does.